is all about Bitcoin, a show dedicated to all things questions and markets related to Bitcoin. Little B for the currency and Bitcoin, big B for the network, a collective journey to understand, apply, and use this innovation, all Bitcoin, all the time. I'm your host, Christine Lee. Let's have a live look at Bitcoin right now. The coin is Bitcoin price. XPX index is trading, is currently at $43,402. Bitcoin is surging up almost 4% over the past 24 hours. The most reliable reference prices for institutions since 2014 are now published under the Coindesk branch, also globally as the leader in crypto news events and data. Let's take a look at some of our top stories. So Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell saying aggressive stimulus is no longer needed to support the U.S. economy and that the U.S. Central Bank is preparing to raise rates and reduce its bond buying program at a confirmation hearing before a congressional subcommittee today. Powell adding that private stable coins could operate alongside a digital dollar and that Fed's digital currency report is ready to go and will be released in the coming weeks. Meanwhile, Bitcoin's plunge in recent days, putting pressure on digital assets and blockchain-related stocks, most of which have taken an even bigger hit. Shares of crypto exchange Coinbase have been an outlier, losing less than Bitcoin. Brightscope and digital assets data telling Coindesk that, quote, some institutions use crypto equities as a proxy for crypto itself. It's easier for hedge funds to buy coin, that is the stock ticker behind Coinbase, than it is for them to hold BTC directly for various reasons. Finally, the hash rate of major Bitcoin mining pools nearing recovery days after computing power on the network fell following an internet blackout in Kazakhstan, data from BTC.com shows. Between January 5th and 6th, the hash rate of top mining pools fell by 11% amid protests in the country and has since narrowed to around 2%. Kazakhstan is the second largest crypto mining hub, a big winner following China's crypto ban, though some miners are looking to exit because of rising energy constraints and costs. The chart of the day is brought to you by Crypto.com, the world's fastest growing crypto app. Fed Chair Jerome Powell's hawkish stance on the economy follows December Fed minutes revealing policymakers had discussed aggressive interest rate hikes alongside a faster pace to normalize its balance sheet. Crypto trading data firm Keiko saying the Fed's, quote, tightening of financial conditions is expected to negatively impact risk assets such as equities and crypto as they become less attractive than safe haven bonds. Keiko adding that the impact of the Fed's December meeting was sent the uh, has sent the correlation between Bitcoin and traditional assets to the highest in more than a year, as seen in this chart, with traders reacting swiftly to the prospect of monetary tightening. During the volatility, Bitcoin behaves strongly like a risk asset. Bitcoin has dropped nearly 40% since hitting record highs near $69,000 in November, and transactions have fallen about 10% since that peak. All right, joining us now to discuss is Rodrigo Vacuna. CFO at crypto infrastructure provider Prime Trust. Hello there, Rodrigo. Thanks for joining us. So Bitcoin is rising after falling over the past few days. What's behind this volatility in your view? Well, first, thanks again for having me on the show, Christine. It's good to see you again. Um, I think there's a lot of things going on within the market. And taking a step back, what we do at Prime Trust is we see a whole host of entrants coming into the market, be it retail investors, institutions, miners, and their underlying activities. I think from a drop perspective, when you look at each of those parties, miners are arguably some of the most important and most influential. They're literally creating Bitcoin and then making the decision to liquidate. And I think there was some sense of minor capitulation recently. However, after that capitulation, I think that was a buying zone for the institutionals who are looking to take longer positions. And that's creating, you know, the 3% raise that we've seen within today's market. Mm -hmm. How do you compare and differentiate between what trading activity is going on behind retail investors, miners, and institutions? Uh, the benefit of kind of where we sit within the market is we can see and identify who's doing what. And from a retail perspective, I think the story isn't volatility, it's adoption. Overall adoption is going up within the market. And if Bitcoin fulfills its mission of being digital gold, it'll create more scarcity as retail investors go up. And um, we see that adoption is driving that level of scarcity. In terms of institutions, we see their positions increasing. And unfortunately, in some cases, 
where if someone might be leveraged both in the equities market and in the crypto market, we'll see them release some of their positions in times like this. And then from miners, we can see whether or not they're looking to cover their CapEx or their OpEx long term relative to if they have a net unrealized profit or loss. Mm -hmm. Uh, BTC transactions are down from their November peak, but in terms of custody, trading, escrow, settlement activity, what do you see you seeing on your end? So we've seen it's actually a 50x increase in year over year trading. So while there's relative decrease more recently, um, what we're seeing long term, when you actually take a broader analysis of the overall time series, um, we're seeing much greater adoption and we're seeing much greater volumes and much larger custody balances and much larger escrow balances in addition to settlement uh, transactions. So we're even we've hit over three and a half billion a month. Um, and that's just kind of a broader indicator that people are have more activity uh, across those institutional investor classes. Interesting. I wonder if you have any thoughts on Fed Chair Jerome Powell's comments at his confirmation hearing, how will rate hikes and tapering affect long-term positive sentiment? Sure. The Fed, I think, is smart to take a bit of a hawkish position on um, what could be a very high inflation within the U.S. The one thing that the Fed wants to do is avoid inflation, but worse uh, is um, prevent stagflation. And so having a couple of interest rate hikes over 2022, as Goldman also um, increased their view that that's going to happen four times next year as well. I think it's very wise of both the Fed and of Chairman Powell to take that position. I think that's exactly the type of kind of monetary policy that we need to take within the U.S. In terms of Bitcoin, what are your top predictions for 2022? I think 2022 is going to be a very exciting year. I personally have a uh, fancy dinner bet with a good friend of mine that we hit $100,000 in the next 18 months. So I believe that adoption is going to increase scarcity within Bitcoin. I think institutions are going to continue to take on bigger positions and that miners are going to continue to hold because there are higher days to come over 2022. All right. Got a lot riding on it, including a fancy dinner bed. All right, Rodrigo, thanks for joining us. That was Prime Trust CFO Rodrigo Vicuna. Coming up, Coindesk unveils Trump era efforts to regulate the crypto industry. What happened and what could have been? That's next. What's up, everybody? This is Spencer Dinwiddie. And I'm Solo Cisse. And this is New Money, brought to you by Coindesk. All I hear, go get the money. So I go get it. Get it, get it. Hate means I do something right. right. So I'm a letter. Yeah, I'm a letter. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm a letter. I, I hit the nail on the head. Yeah, yeah, I'm a letter. Uh -huh. What we'll see is money not only being exchanged for this digital currency, but the frictionless movement across borders. It's gonna be able to flow as easy as a text message. Staying true to yourself, right? Like you've always been true to yourself. I just want to share that with everybody. You know, you could be yourself in full capacity. It's our duty to take our visions and be fearless in our pursuit. Be my most authentic self and show people that, look, I'm an athlete and yes, I'm also part of the LGBT community. My goal is to have, you know, my own NFT, my own entire IP, like my own everything. You know, how do you think, you know, blockchain and crypto impacts the way you think about it? Well, I think everyone has like some sort of like, sure. Like, uh, how'd you get Bitcoin? It's like asking someone if they smoke. It's like, uh, <laughs> it's like, yo. Embracing where the world is going. And when the whole world shut down, we saw just how important tech was. It was more so of my style and the foods that I cooked that kind of pushed me. I wanted to live the lifestyle of an athlete or an artist while doing what I love. Having that open mind, having that, that flexibility, just allows you to be of, of so much more service to, you know what I'm saying, youth or society in general. Gamers, you know, maybe it's because you guys just hustle different. Anything you want to be great at, you got to put hours and hours in every single day.
Welcome back. All right. New documents uncovered by Coindesk shed light on Trump era crypto policy. Among our findings is that Trump's son law, Jared Kushner, advocated behind the scenes for a U.S. digital currency, among other revelations in the 250-page trove from Steven Mnuchin's tenure at Treasury. Joining us now to discuss is Coindesk columnist and features reporter David Morris. Hello, David. David, thanks for joining us. So Coindesk made a FOIA request, a Freedom of Information Act request for former Treasury Secretary oh. Steve Mnuchin's crypto-related correspondence during his four-year tenure. Sifting through those 250 pages of documents, what were your biggest takeaways? Uh, well, I think that the biggest substantive thing that we found was um, many people will remember that in December of 2020, right as the Trump administration was on the way out the door, um, they uh, proposed some pretty onerous new reporting requirements that would have involved exchanges having to collect uh, correspondent data about anyone who received a certain amount of crypto to an unhosted wallet. So a, a software wallet that you have on your computer or your phone or something like that. Uh, exchanges would have had to uh, report that data. Um, and for a lot of reasons, including the fact that in some cases that data is not available, uh, the industry pointed out that that was a really unwieldy and unworkable uh, rule that the Trump administration was frankly pretty clear really try the door before the, the shift in power. Um, what we found uh, in, our, in our documents that we got through the FOIA request was that there had been a lot of efforts by uh, the Blockchain Association, Coin Center, and other uh, industry entities and groups to push back against that. Um, and uh, it was not met with much receptivity or, frankly, anything really substantive by the Trump administration. Um, we saw that requests to talk to Mnuchin were shuffled off to uh, subordinates who then in turn, according to our other reporting, did not really give a significant airing to the concerns of, of industry groups. Now, luckily in this case, that law uh, died uh, and did not go into effect and was sort of soft tabled by the Biden administration when they took power. Um, but it was uh, interesting to see that these objections were not really aired uh, very thoroughly with the, the Trump administration and, and FinCEN and other rulemaking entities. So that was probably the main David, takeaway, seemed, I think, for, for me. It seemed it was rather hasty, the whole rule uh, proposal around those stricter reporting requirements on private wallets. And kudos to Blockchain Association, Chris and Smith, for getting on the ball and pushing forward uh, their concerns. Uh, what was also interesting to me was that they were intent on developing a policy with the Trump administration. Uh, they were going to hold a crypto summit with uh, Block and former Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey, Coinbase CEO Brian Armstrong, among other crypto bigwigs. But COVID shut those plans down. And so it's interesting right. to wonder what could have been, what they have developed, uh, what would they have developed in terms of sound policy that would help innovation or, by contrast, develop conservative policy that would have effectively banned crypto with those strict reporting rules on private wallets? I mean, where could it have gone? Yeah, and it, it speaks to kind of a larger question about the Trump administration, which is, you know, one of the things that uh, Jerry Brito at Coin Center said that I think is is quite accurate, which is that they didn't do anything horrifically bad for crypto or anything particularly good for crypto until that 11th hour effort in December. Um, and uh, so there's a bit of a, a blank spot when we look at trying to evaluate the Trump administration on their crypto policy. Obviously, from 2016 to 2020 was this huge period of change and growth where the, the industry sort of went from a very low point after the ICO washout um, and then back up to uh, some greater relevance. Um, so you can kind of excuse the Trump administration for not necessarily having its eye on that ball the entire time. Uh, but we did, you know, mostly thanks to COVID, miss out on some potentially uh, conducive changes uh, based on those roundtables that, that were planned. And another thing that we found in the, in the documents was, um, and there's not a whole lot to it, but we found a very interesting email from Jared Kushner to Steven Mnuchin. Uh, Kushner, as people know, is Trump's uh, son-in-law who had a, a lot of different duties and, and sort of a lot of power within the administration. 
Uh, in early 2018, I believe, he sent an email to Mnuchin suggesting that uh, the U.S. explore a CBDC, which on the timeline, uh, a central bank digital currency, which on the timeline is fairly early for that interest. This is before uh, a lot of concerns really started coming down the pike around uh, China's plans for a CBDC. Um, so it, there is some evidence that, you know, the Trump world was was paying attention. Um, and, and so it does seem like we missed out on, I mean, thanks to COVID, obviously there's a, there's very good reasons. They had different things to be worried about. Um, but we did miss out on what, you know, could have been productive regulation um, or at least productive dialogue from the Trump administration because of that change in the landscape. It was interesting to read Jared Kushner's emails on CBDCs. And I wonder how you would compare the Trump administration to, say, the Biden administration and their focus on crypto, which has, you know, from what we know, not been very lucrative, not substantive. Beneficial. It has not, not been super beneficial. I think I would even put it a little bit more strongly than that because, you know, there's there's a lot of similarities between the rule that Mewchin tried to push through um, via FinCEN about uh, reporting requirements for exchanges going to wallets and then the, you know, arguably loose language in uh, over the summer, the uh, infrastructure bill, there was a lot of concern about a clause that raise reporting requirements, not just for exchanges, but even for uh, theoretically software developers, decentralized services, and other things where it's really hard, if not impossible, to comply. Um, there has been some suggestion that that idea was championed by Janet Yellen, who, of course, was uh, the uh, Treasury appointment appointee of the Biden administration. So there's really some, I think, common ground in terms of maybe not necessarily intent, but certainly common ground in how little seems to be understood by certain members of both administrations about the, the practical realities um, and the way that legislation would need to be structured to actually, you know, maybe hopefully get to the goals that regulators want um, while still preserving the unique features of this technology. So um, if, if there's a common thread, it's not a great one. Yeah, a lot of education still needed at the government level. All right, David, thank you so much. Great reporting. You can see the whole article on Coindesk.com. That was Coindesk Chief Insights columnist, David Morris. Oh, we missed him. All right. Sorry, David. That's it for All About Bitcoin. I'm your host, Christine Lee, and we'll do it all over again tomorrow at 3 p.m. in New York. Also join us tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Eastern for First Mover. You're watching Coindesk TV.